So the first talk of this session is Professor A.G. Philip. He has done his MSc and PhD from Cochin University of Science and Technology and then he has done his postdoc from TIFR and University of Regensburg, Germany. So today he is going to talk about ultra-fast and nonlinear optics lab, the journey. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I will be talking to you about the journey of the ultra-fast and nonlinear optics lab for the last 22 years. I joined the institute in year 2000 and uh, since that time we have been working in three different areas started at different times. So the first one was nonlinear optical behavior of novel materials. So this we started as soon as I joined because uh, that was the kind of work I was doing immediately before in TFR Mumbai where I was a postdoc. And uh, then uh, around 2010 we got into laser produced plasmas generation and characterization which we continue to do. And uh, later in 2017 particularly with the interest of uh, Nancy who was my PhD student, she just graduated. We got into surface structuring using exotic laser beams, exotic and non-exotic, both kinds of laser beams. So these are the people who have contributed as PhD students, Anija, Sandeep, Shafi, uh, Smijesh, uh, Pranita, Nancy and Binoy. Some of them are not regular RRI PhD students but they worked with me and so we got them registered in other places. So, but uh, all of them have been uh, very, very good and they are all well placed now. And uh, there are also other major contributors like the postdocs and all that. So, Jindo, then uh, Karthik, Priya, Kishore, uh, all, all were not postdocs, but they were, some of them actually worked with me as VSPs for extended periods or then as research assistants, Srikanth, Anup, Jijil, Kavya, Nitin. So, and then the, I had several collaborators. So, the major ones are here. Uh, T. Pradeep from IIT Madras, then uh, Professor Gobal Rao from UMass Boston, then M. Rao, M. Rao from Clemson University, Jen Thomas from the University of Central Florida, then Rong Chao Jin from Carnegie Mellon and uh, Mark Humphrey from ANU Canberra. So, they all have contributed to the to the, to the results that I'll be showing here today. And coming to the subject, so looking at laser matter interaction regimes, we have the perturbative regime and uh, the strong field regime and in between we have the soft ablation regime. So the perturbative regime means we are talking about bound electrons. There is no ionization in the system, but the system is actually subjected to intense, uh, I mean strong fields and so we have second order nonlinearities, third order nonlinearities and all that there. But if you go to the strong field regime, which is beyond something like 10 to the power 16 watts per centimeter square, which is uh, you need special lasers to achieve that kind of intensity. Once you reach there, you have effects like high harmonic generation, sub femtosecond, that is attosecond x-rays and electron pulses, uh, hard x-rays, all those things you can generate if you are in the hard uh, ablation regime, in the strong field regime. So we have worked in both these regimes and our lasers are capable of just touching 10 to the power of 16 watts per centimeter square. So that's a kind of borderline, uh, you are neither there nor here. So we have confined ourselves to more or less into these two regimes. So the laser systems we use are, uh, we have uh, the NDIAC laser that gives 7 nanosecond pulses at 10 hertz repetition rate and each pulse is something like 270 millijoules at 532 nanometers. This is a pretty powerful laser. And then, uh, then we have the tsunami which generates femtosecond laser pulses, 100 femtosecond pulses at uh, very high rep rate. It's a mod locked laser. So this gives you 82 megahertz rep rate and the power of the beam is 500 a milliwatt, uh, this translates to something like 12 or 13 nanojoules per pulse and it emits at 800 nanometers. So the emission from the tsunami, uh, because it's only nanojoules, we want to amplify those pulses. So this is the amplifier for that and this again produces the same kind of uh, width, 100 from the second pulses, but the rep rate has go gone down substantially, it is only 10 hertz, uh, but 
each laser pulse now has a very high, I mean relatively high energy of 10 millijoules and again at 800 nanometers. So, this laser is pumped by this laser. So, this is the general structure of the lasers that we have and it is possible for us to actually use all these three lasers independently. So, when we bought these lasers in 2000, companies used to actually sell them as separate boxes. So, that gives us some advantage of really taking the beams out separate and all that. But nowadays for stability and also for probably commercial reasons, they put everything in one box. So, you really cannot uh, separate out these beams so much as uh, we can do. Okay, coming to the first part, the nonlinear optical behavior of uh, novel materials. Yeah, yeah, actually the output of uh, this laser will go into this laser and then yeah, so then you, you, you actually have another titanium sapphire road because this is a titanium sapphire laser, the uh, laser medium is titanium sapphire. So, you have another titanium sapphire, in fact two crystals which amplify. So, for biasing or generating inversion in those two crystals you need this laser. It's not That's like having a cavity or something. Sorry? It's not like having a cavity or? It, it is a cavity actually because it has the what we call the regenerative cavity. Mm -hmm. It is called regenerative amplification followed by a double pass amplification. That is the way it works. So, the seed is from here. That is very low energy, but the amplification gain is very high because you are actually amplifying nano joule pulses to milli joule. So, you know the gain is like a million about which is very high actually. So, looking at the NLO behavior, so let us see what is the difference between linear optics and nonlinear optics. So, basically the optical properties of a material like refractive index absorption coefficient, they are independent of light intensity if you are in the linear optical regime and the principle of superposition is applicable. The frequency of light that is its color is not changed by passing through the medium and beams of light have no effect on each other when passing through the same region in a medium. So, these are all the attributes of linear optics, but when you come to nonlinear optics, you see that the optical properties depend on the intensity of the light. So, if you put in more intensity, then you see that the refractive index, the absorption coefficient, these things start changing. Then the principle of superposition is not applicable because the waves will actually interact with each other. The frequency of light color may get altered depending on phase matching conditions and all that. That is what we make use of in second harmonic generation and all that. And photons do interact within a nonlinear optical medium. So, that light can be used to control light or several effects are possible in the domain of nonlinear optics. As a simple example, I can tell you about second harmonic and third harmonic generation. So, consider an electron which is oscillating something like this in a system. So, this kind of an oscillation happens, this dipolar oscillation happens when there is a lack of symmetry in the system. So, in such a system you can expect in addition to the fundamental, its second harmonic to come out. So, that second harmonic beam if you can amplify and if you can convert, if the conversion efficiency can be made high, then you are basically generating the second harmonic or a different color from this laser. In a similar way, you can have third harmonic also coming out. The very first example of second harmonic generation was it happened in 1961 immediately after Maiman discovered the ruby laser and here Frank and et al, they what they did, they used a ruby laser which was focused into a quartz crystal and the quartz crystal, the output when it was analyzed using a simple prism, they found that in addition to the fundamental. Uh, there was also the second harmonic. The fundamental beam is at 6943 uh, angstroms and the second harmonic appeared at exactly half the wavelength or double the frequency at 347.5 angstroms. So, that is just one example, but we do not really work with uh, second harmonic or third harmonic that is mostly the domain of crystals. We work with uh, <coughs> materials uh, in, in more I mean liquid form mostly we have used several liquids actually and we look at the third order optical nonlinearities. So, the Z-scan experiment is actually a very popular experiment for detecting these kind of uh, nonlinearities. Essentially, we find out 
the nonlinear refractive index and the nonlinear absorption coefficient of materials. So, that is this experiment is useful for. So, there are two versions of the experiment here. This is called an open aperture experiment. So, what it means is uh, this is kind of a misnomer people sometimes get confused. There is no aperture at all in the case of an open aperture experiment. There is a laser beam which is focused and the sample that you want to study is then moved in this focal region through a, di a distance z. So, that is why it is called z scan or z scan and as you move it. So, let us say here you have the z and as you move it you measure its transmission. That is all what you do. It is a very simple experiment uh, in paper. Uh, doing can be a little bit, uh, there are practical issues can occur because of the laser, because of the sample and all that, but that is a different thing. The technique, the idea is very, very simple in fact. And from this kind of a graph, you can actually calculate the nonlinear absorption coefficient which is beta. The linear expression is just alpha is alpha naught but the nonlinear expression is alpha is alpha naught plus beta i where beta is a nonlinear absorption coefficient. And if you put an aperture here like this, then it is possible for us to actually measure the nonlinear refractive index because if your sample has nonlinear refractive index, as your sample moves towards the focal point, because the quantity N2 i increases here N2 is actually the coefficient for uh, the nonlinear refractive index and I will increase. We know uh, for a focused laser beam the intensity is highest at the focal point. So, this quantity N2 i is going to increase. So, that means the refractive index of your sample keeps increasing as you move it towards your focus. So, that starts acting like another lens. So, the sample will behave like a second lens here the power of which actually changes as a function of its position with respect to the focus. So, that is why from that kind of a behavior uh, from that you can as actually find out the power of this lens which actually gives you the nonlinear refractive index value. So, because this experiment can measure both the nonlinear refractive index and nonlinear absorption coefficient this is pretty popular. And um, when I when I joined RRI in January 2000, I had just submitted a paper to PRB from uh, TAFR where I was and that is that is where I actually started working with metal nanoparticles. My first introduction to nanoparticles was in TAFR Mumbai because we had couple of collaborators. One was Professor Rivigan from IIT Mumbai and the other was uh, T Pradeep from IIT uh, Madras. So, they gave us different kinds of materials. Uh, Ravikant used to give organometallics and uh, um, Pradeep actually gave gold and silver nanoparticles. So, we this is how gold and silver this is uh, a set of gold nanoparticles each one having a different size. So, it is interesting to see that I think everybody knows by now that gold nanoparticles metal nanoparticles will have different color depending on its size. So, yeah. Sure. So, when you are doing the uh, Z scan experiment, huh. so, um, so the, the uh, uh, inside the so, inside the sample, hmm. uh, close to the focal point, the intensity is very high, probably uh, nonlinearity will be maximum. Yes. But now, uh, since your sample has a finite width, so, the signal you get also uh, the intensity varies over the sample right. So, is there a way to uh, actually map out like. Uh, yes, this is accounted for in the theory. Oh, okay. yeah. you need to use some theory. To yeah, because uh, see the, the theory actually came for the, this technique was originally developed for refractive index calculation, but then it was found that you can easily extend it to the uh, nonlinear absorption also. In either case the original theory which came in 1990 it takes it considers a Gaussian beam. So, the beam itself has this you know uh, Gaussian profile and the uh, finite size of the sample also is considered. So, it is a detailed theory which okay. actually calculates the transmitted intensity. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, the good thing about metal nanoparticles is that they enhance the local electric field 
you put that's why we use metals for metal thin films and all that for uh, effects like uh, surface enhanced amine scattering. One of my slides is on search which I will show later. So, uh, we in fact made some calculations using FDTD simulations to find out the field enhancement. So, these are direct calculations of uh, Maxwell's equations. So, this happened much later, but I thought I will say this here uh, because this is the reason why many of our kind of experiments in metal nanoparticles happen. So, one of my previous students, Gaurav Tiwari, he in fact did not complete PhD, he got a good job and he left in between, but uh, not before publishing, uh, be, not before being a co-author in a good journal like Small. So, he actually contributed to these calculations uh, in this paper which we published in 2018. Just wanted to say that these kind of calculations are possible for nano, metal nanoparticles and we can find out uh, the local field enhancement they provide. So, coming going back to year 2000, so this is the paper that came in PRB and uh, I, I sent this paper on 20th of December in 1999 and joined RRI on uh, 29th of December because somebody told me if you join after 2000 you are not going to get pension. <laughs> so, I took the first flight which was available and rushed here and uh, went to Krishna <laughs> and I think it was Krishna's. So that became 2004. <laughs> what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, it went on for another four years. <laughs> so, I was saved. So, yeah. Oh, you're oh, you're the first person. Okay, okay. I thought it's Sadik. No. Okay, it's you. Okay, okay. So anyway, so this was the reason for my rush and joining here before nineteen <laughs> and was over. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this is what happened. So we sent this paper, and it was in this paper that for the first time this kind of uh, behavior that is humps on the open aperture C scan was detected by anybody. So, at that point of time, it was not very clear to us. So, just because we saw these hums, I really had to look de in detail into the happenings and then realized that something that was never mentioned in the original CSCAN papers was actually happening. It is a very simple process called saturable absorption. So, this material was actually showing saturable absorption at some intensities and reverse saturable absorption at other intensities. So, this we were the first people to find this and uh, later, so the, th that was the first report on the nonlinear optical transmission in metal nanoparticles. Then several papers came after that. We ourselves revisited the same system with some difference in 2012 when I was on a sabbatical. So, this time collaborated with uh, Jane Thomas and Rong Chao Jin because Rong Chao from Carnegie Mellon, he is somebody who synthesizes very fine clusters and all that. So, that needs some skill and he was publishing in PNAs and all that. So, Rong Chao actually came to UCF where I was having my sabbatical to give a talk and both me and Jane who was uh, my mentor there, we attended this talk and that is when I suddenly thought about my previous uh, interaction with metal nanoparticles. So, spoke to Rong Chao, he immediately agreed to give us some clusters. So, the advantage here is that these clusters are really small. So, we were working with, uh, in 2000, we were working with 20 to 30 nanometer sized uh, nanoparticles, but here Rong Chao was able to give us 25 atoms of gold making a cluster, 38 atoms of gold making a cluster, AU144 like that. So, and this is uh, the calculated energy, energy uh, spectra. So, we wanted to compare the performance of these clusters with uh, regular nanoparticles. So, we bought uh, the AU nanoparticles of 4 nanometer size where you see that the surface plasma is just starting to come up. So, these nanoparticles are known for their surface plasma resonances, but uh, if you go very low in size, they will disappear. So, this is uh, somewhere the regime where it starts coming up. So, we just wanted to compare these samples with this sample to understand what is the significance of the SPR here and just that actually to, paid off and uh, uh, so this is. Let you just, uh, yes. just to ask a very simple question about the clusters. Hmm. So, these are obviously, I mean, there's a goal when you talk about spectral properties of the cluster like hmm. AU25. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, they're not molecules. So what is huh. it that they do? I'm just, I mean, maybe not relevant <laughs> to your talk, but it's just a very I'm relevant curious. question. Okay. Actually, uh, it's a very relevant question in the sense that these sometimes people uh, call them as gold molecules because the reason for that is that it just has 25 atoms in it or 38 atoms. These are magic numbers. So not all numbers will make a cluster. So stable clusters can be made only by some precise numbers of atoms. Then they behave like molecules in fact. So by looking at these absorption spectra, actually these absorption spectra, if you, if you look here, this is more like a molecule and this is more like a semiconductor. So as the number of atoms increases, the, the behavior changes. Yes, yeah, and you know, 25 atoms, it can have, they, they have actually calculated these energy bands and levels for this. So when it really comes down, I'll show you another example where. Just electromagnetic. Yes. That's yeah, yeah. So I, for a very large yes, yes. Yeah. Very, very <laughs> yeah, numerical so calculations. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's how it's done. And uh, so what we found was, I mean, now we could clearly find the saturation that we had seen way back in year 2000 was now very clear, very pronounced, so that, you know, it's going so well up in the 4 nanometer nanoparticle. But when you reduce the, this was the interesting part. When you reduce the size to smaller clusters, this completely disappeared. So now if you replot the same thing in terms of the input days of fluence on the x-axis and the normalized transmission on the y-axis, then you can see that the smaller clusters behave exactly like optical limiters. So optical limiters are those materials which when you put in more intensity into the system, the transmission will come down. So these are good optical limiters. Here there is a hesitation because it is it is thinking whether it should go up or down and when you come to the 4 nanometer plasmonic nanoparticle, it clearly goes up and then it comes down. So we published these results in uh, nanoletters and then later with Kishore who was my VSP and later who went to South Korea for doing a PhD, uh, we published several papers together. So he, uh, he also synthesizes these materials very well. He's a very good uh, synthetic uh, material scientist. So he made AG9 quantum clusters. He had just nine atoms of silver. And we, uh, again, uh, calculations were done. We did not calculate, but uh, other collaborators made these calculations. And uh, they found the energy states. And uh, so energy transfer, charge transfer is possible in the system because um, he coupled these nanoparticles with uh, what you call uh, gallium carbon nitride or something, GCN. And uh, so then they did all the chemistry there and uh, the nonlinearity was measured by us. So again showed very good optical nonlinearity which we published in. Reji, I just wanted to ask you something from your previous slide. Hmm. So for the 4 nanometer particle, why is the transmission going up and then that's also limiting, right? Because yeah. I mean, at high fluence, yes. it is going down. Yeah, it, it is non-linearity. There is limiting. See, what happens there is these, when you have a plasmonic nanoparticle, it has surface plasma resonance in that. So this is like a very strong absorption. Whenever a system has a strong absorption of that kind, the first tendency of the system is to saturate. So the absorption will saturate, but the excited state will start absorbing. So you're yeah. saying that is because of the plasmonic yes. contribution yes. for the smallest one. Exactly. See, in the, in the case of the smaller ones, in the case of the smaller ones, there is no plasmonic contribution. Okay. So saturation okay. does not happen so much, but excited state absorption happens, and therefore uh, what you see is actually the limiting behavior. Okay. Here, both are there, and they compete. Huh. So initially, yeah, actually one has to do rate equation analysis for this. I will show that uh, later on how this is done. Uh, so then you will get the, we can reproduce the whole thing. We can simulate the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was the story of AG9 quantum clusters. And okay, so here the numerical simulation of this is an experiment. So uh, this is, uh, so you have to consider a Gaussian pulse. Here is the expression for the Gaussian pulse and uh, the, how it varies, how the, the radius varies along the z axis. And, uh, 
z naught by omega 0 square by lambda is called the Rayleigh range or the depth of uh, focus. So, we have to consider all these things and then we assume a certain molecular structure energy level structure usually what is accepted is a five level system where you have a series of singlets and a series of triplets. So, transitions happen between singlets between triplets there are many processes stimulated absorption, stimulated emission, intersystem crossing, vibration relaxation. So, all these things happen in the molecules. So, we have to consider everything and then write down the rate equations. So, the set of uh, partial differential equations which consider the populations of each of the states, the transient populations of yes. Yes, because it is a pulse. So, it is a one sided Gaussian or the one? No, it is a symmetric Gaussian. No, Why? T is goes from what? Minus infinity to plus infinity is it or? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so it is just a you are starting at 0? Uh, well, theoretically from minus infinity to plus infinity, but you have the pulse width tau p there. Yeah. So, for all practical no, purposes. Uh, what I am saying is, is it like a, so this is just you are just considering one pulse. One pulse. Okay. Yes, one pulse. And at whatever your time t equal to 0, you are you have a pulse at r equal to 0 basically. Yes. Right, that is your origin of time and space basically. Correct. Okay. Okay. So, you consider the pulse propagating through the system and you solve the rate equations. You solve the equations usually using uh, the Ruge Kutta fourth order method and then you can actually find out, you can actually plot the populations of each of these states uh, in time. So, that is possible to do. So, a complete analysis of the data that you measure from a Z scan experiment requires that you do the rate equation analysis. There are some unknown parameters and all that like the excited state lifetimes which uh, we have to look into literature or measuring ourselves is not easy. So, there are some such uh, challenges, but still this actually gives us a very good idea of the dynamics of the excitation in the system. So, we also did some other interesting things like the white light continuum C scan. So, the normal C scan is a monochromatic C scan in the sense that you use just one laser wavelength for doing it. So, we were mostly working with 532 nanometers the second harmonic output of the NDAG laser for this. Uh, however, it is possible for us to generate a white light uh, output uh, by using higher order nonlinearities in materials like water. So, this is just tap water. We what we did we just focused the femtosecond laser pulse into tap water and that actually gives you the white light there. And this white light is actually femtosecond it is uh, temporal width is only femtoseconds. Therefore, you can use these for again optical limiting studies or C scan studies and we have done that. And here you just cannot use simple detectors for detecting your transmitted and uh, preference beams. You have to use spectrometers. So, we have used two spectrometers one here, one here. Actually, this is uh, what we call the ocean optics spectrometer, handheld spectrometer with two channels in that. So, they are identical. So, we, you need identical spectrometers, otherwise, everything will go wrong. So, we used the ocean optics dual spectrometer for these measurements. And uh, nothing. You can deliberately add some impurity still it works. <laughs> Sorry? Huh. Actually not. No, no. This is uh, this is something called self phase modulation. So, that is why you get white light here. So, it is a completely nonlinear optical phenomenon as your pulse passes through the system because of the third order nonlinearity the pulse itself will change its phase. That is why it is still femtosecond and not uh, huh. getting current. Yeah, yes. So, so this is called self phase modulation. I mean uh, it can be calculated, you can calculate how much uh, spec. This actually happens even even in regular propagation. Mm -hmm. So, when you want to pass a regular femtosecond pulse through normal uh, media like glass and all, there also SPM happens. But uh, with my kind of pulse with 100 femtoseconds, which is now considered long, when we bought it in um, in year 2000, I mean nobody nobody in, in India had an amplifier at that time. By the way, 
oscillator a few places had, but the amplifier was ours was the first. So it was so fancy at that time, but now people are talking about 35 femtoseconds, 10 femtoseconds and all that. So that is considered short and those pulses when they pass through even glass, they really generate uh, speed. And, uh, how does the energy compare with the original pulse? Uh, the energy is not very good because uh, it depends on the material. See water is not a good converter as far as the efficiency is concerned. There are some crystals like sapphire crystal, then uh, there are also a few other CF2 I think. So these crystals can be purchased, we actually purchased recently. They give very good efficiency, like maybe 20 percent or something. Here in this case maybe 5 percent or 10 percent, less than 10 percent actually. But we get a very bright uh, uh, spot and we focus that and we do the uh, C-scan experiment here. So by using the spectrometers, Huh. So this is for what actually the previous one? Rate equations we, this is for, under, uh, yeah. The, the yeah, yes. yeah, this is actually for understanding the dynamics. So the it, is N, N0, uh, NSI. Huh. Okay, okay, I will tell you that. See, uh, the, these uh, N0 is the population in uh, ground state, S0 and the N1 is the population state S1. See for molecules they have the singlet system, normally the molecules exist in singlet states and they also have the triplet system where the total multiplicity becomes a 3, here it is 1. So depending on the valence electrons spins. So uh, it is possible for a transition to happen from the singlet system to the triplet system. So that is called inter-system crossing. So if you want to really analyze how a, a laser pulse passes through a system, what are the effects, I mean what happens to the populations, then you have to write down, you have to model the system first and this five level model is pretty good for any molecule and then you have to write down the rates. See for example, uh, see I mean when you want to write down the population for S1, you say N1 is equal to, I mean you see which are the inward contributions and which are the outward things. So inward contributions are, is the absorption from here, absorption from S0 to S1 is what adds to the number N1 and an emission from Sn to S1 also adds to the number N1. But an inter-system crossing, stimulated emission, spontaneous emission, these things actually decrease that number. So that's why when you write the rate equation like you can see here. So this is uh, sigma 0 is the ground state absorption cross section, sigma 1 is the loss, uh, the absorption to a higher state and uh, ns2 by tau s2 is actually spontaneous emission coming from up and coming down there. So each of those processes are accounted for in this. So why we do this is because if we do that we will get a clear idea of uh, regarding the population densities on each of these states in time. So if you look here, the time is given in 10 to the power minus 8 seconds. So this is like 10 nanosecond, 20 nanosecond. You put in an, a 7 nanosecond pulse and within something like 10 nanoseconds almost all processes are over. So this is for getting a dynamic picture of the system that we use the rate equations. If you only want to look at the results of a C scan, this is not required. But this gives you a better idea. So coming to the white light C scan, we measured in coumarin 120D. Uh, this is a dye and it absorbs at 800 nanometers. So we used our, uh, so this was the sample that we used. And then from the data that you get from the spectrometers, you can actually uh, find out the nonlinear non transmission for any wavelength within that range. So once you do that, you can actually reconstruct the nonlinear absorption. So now here we have basically from this experiment reconstructed the two photon absorption spectrum of coumarin. Yes. Is this obtained from Haldi, this coumarin, that is the same thing there? Uh, you mean the company? No, no, the, the compound, the coumarin. Coumarin 120? Turmeric. Huh. Turmeric. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I did not get it from turmeric, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we bought it from somewhere. Coumarin is. 
Turmeric is okay. actually not common. Curcumin, is it? Curcumin. Okay, that's that, curcumin. That is curcumin. Okay. Curcumin. Okay. That we have worked with. Oh. It's not coumarin. No, this, this, this is a this is a synthesized laser dye. This is a laser dye. Laser dye. Laser dye. Yeah. Okay. It's a it's a laser medium also. Okay. You can use it also as a laser medium. So okay. yeah. I was working with laser dyes from long, long times, okay. from my PhD days itself. So hence the fascination for dyes. So anyway, so from this experiment, what we achieve from this kind of experiment is that in one shot, you actually get the two photon absorption spectrum of your molecule. Otherwise, you have to use an OPA or something. It's a tunable, you know, experiment. several C scan experiments you have to do. Here in one shot, you do all the C scans together. Okay, so now moving on to another thing, a new idea for an optical diode. So people have actually made various kinds of optical diodes of various uh, efficiencies and all that. So an optic. Just, hmm. just a curiosity question. Hmm. So previous slide. Hmm. So this two photon absorption. Hmm. This is what the other process is parametric down conversion. Will this also happen? No, not in this because it really does not have the uh, intensity for that. And also, see, those things really need face matching. So this is a non-face matched system. So it doesn't happen. So the idea for an optical diode actually occurred to me just like that one fine morning. So and it's really surprising that nobody actually did. It was so surprising that nobody actually did this before. Because uh, what is done here is I told you about saturable absorption and reverse saturable absorption, right? So these are two. Uh, things that you can expect from like the metal nanoparticles showed uh, sometimes saturable. So there are materials which predominantly show saturable absorption. So that kind of for a given wavelength. So that kind of materials are actually used in you know picocircle lasers and for Q-switching for mod locking and all that for generating short pulses. So when I was on another uh, sabbatical I found that a yellow glass filter which I was using for my experiments was actually an excellent saturable absorber at 532 nanometers. So this is a yellow colored glass filter but it is a very good saturable absorber for green light. So and then I also had another uh, this is uh, what was a porphyrins, porphyrin solutions, porphyrin molecules are actually very good reverse saturable absorbers at the same wavelength. So the idea was to keep them in tandem just like that. So you, sorry, you keep them in one direction like SA and RSA in that order, you send a beam of light, you get one kind of transmission. But if you send the, if you just turn it around or if you turn the laser around, so turning this around is easier, if you do that, you get a different kind of uh, transmission. So uh, this was so interesting and the first thought I had was, my God, it's so simple. So it must have been reported already. I searched for maybe three days, nobody had reported. So we wrote the paper and immediately it went into APL. So uh, so this is uh, what we call forward bias and this is what we call reverse bias, very similar to the electronics terminology. So not to say that you are getting the very same, very fine non-reversibility in the case of, I mean diodes, electronic diodes don't really allow unless they break down. This is not like that. But still, this we called non-reciprocity of light and later we actually again that, that paper went to nanoliters. So here we found optical diode action from axially asymmetric, no, this, this, this is what we call axially asymmetric nonlinearity in an all carbon solid state, all carbon solid state device. The previous one had liquid in it because porphyrin was a solution. But in a device application you don't want solutions. So here. Uh, multi-layer graphene and uh, C60 films, these were used for this uh, work. Then another new technique which came out was called OPAS. This is optical and photoacoustic C-scan done together. So photoacoustics is where when you want to measure the absorption of something which is highly absorbing. So usually the way to measure absorption is to put your sample in the spectrophotometer and it's implied that the beam actually goes to the other side and you measure otherwise you cannot get the absorption absorbance value. But imagine carbon black. Let us say carbon black of different grades, 
how do you get to know the absorption of, you want to measure the absorption spectrum. So, the only way to do this is to make use of some non radiative mechanism. So, luckily whenever something is highly absorbing, you have heat generated in the system. So, you measure the heat in various ways. You can have photothermal techniques, you can have photoacoustic techniques. In the photoacoustic technique, you use an acoustic transducer to actually measure the sound waves generated by this kind of absorptions in a system. So, we made a photoacoustic cell like this and the sample and, and filled the photoacoustic cell with water and then the sample is always taken in a cuvette. So, put a slot in the center on the lid for keeping the cuvet. So, it was put like that and then the laser beam was allowed to go like this. So, the photo detector on the other side measures, I mean we are using a sample just to demonstrate the proof of principle here, we used a sample that actually transmitted. So, to some extent. So, you can get a normal C scan like that and our acoustic detector here, it measured the complementary thermal part. So, the expectation is that these two signals have to be opposite to each other and they actually were opposite to each other. So, you can see when the C scan goes down, this goes up and when the C scan goes up, this goes down. And then we used real thick samples which do not give any optical C scan at all because it does not allow light to pass through. So, there we could get the photocaustic C scan. Anyway, uh, this work did not really continue much. I think some a few other papers came in the field, but uh, now I am not looking into that literature. So, now coming to the second part laser produced plasmas. So, why do we want to generate plasmas by using lasers. So, this is a real thing that is happening now. These Mars rovers and all that, they have cameras in them, they have lasers. Actually, these lasers will be used to irradiate some rock or something there and the light generated is then detected by cameras and analyzed to find out what are the elements present. So, this is called laser induced breakdown spectroscopy, LIPS. So, that is one of the applications. Then of course, we have more exotic applications like laser driven fusion where you generate electricity. So, uh, the time and intensity scales of light matter interaction. So, from femtoseconds you come down to picoseconds, nanoseconds like that. Initially the excitation, then the melting and finally the ablation. So, these are the three stages of generating a plasma from a target. So, there are various processes happening there. I am not really going into all those. And, uh, the experimental setup basically consists of the laser beam, uh, the vacuum chamber target is here, you generate the plasma here because the laser is focused on this point and then energy meters, oscilloscopes, spectrometers and all that for measuring the spectrum and all that. So, this is the real photograph of the experimental setup. Here is our vacuum chamber, the sample is sitting inside and there is uh, vacuum pumps down there. Here are the uh, two spectrometers. And this is the ICCD which can actually measure the spectra in time. So, it has a very good temporal resolution like uh, every 2 nanoseconds or so you can make measurement of a spectrum. So, it is a pretty powerful system and here you can actually see the photo, photo of the plasma. So, this is the plasma which is generated by the laser in your vacuum chamber on the target. And this is just a sample spectrum we measured on carbon, on a carbon target. Now, we look at various aspects of, uh, uh, yes. So, that particular, uh, for that particular application, why do you need a plasma? Because if, if you are just uh. irradiating something and then uh. looking at the. No, one advantage of plasma is that it is a non-contact measurement. So, if you want to do something else, like see plasma is a, a destructive kind of experiment. Yeah, yeah. So, you cannot, not all materials are, I mean they do not allow to be de destroyed. So, plasma may not be possible there, but when you go to uh, another planet or something, you can really destroy whatever you see around you. There are no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there are no ethical issues there destroying a few things. There won't be any living things and all that. The advantage of doing that is that you get much better uh, light 
Yeah. Yeah, uh, not much better light. These are also known as standoff measurements. Standoff measurements. So, uh, this is one application which is very much used. The other application for standoff measurements is in the case of, uh, you know, explosives. So, when you study explosives, you actually, there are situations, one of my friends in uh, University of Hyderabad is doing it. So, he actually radiates explosives uh, using laser beams to generate an explosion in the lab and uh, he wants to measure the spectrum. So, plasma is the best thing to do that. So, it is uh, better than you cannot do a ramen like this for instance. That is why. So, we look at the expanding plasma. Once the plasma is formed on the target, it expands like that. So, we take photographs of that. So, here you see three different uh, laser pulses, 10 nanosecond, 200 picosecond, 100 femtoseconds. All these different kind of laser pulses are used, are used for generating the plasma and they actually have totally different characteristics. So, we look at all those things. So, this is a time result study of, uh, uh, of the emission of one particular line, the 481 nanometer line from uh, zinc, neutral zinc at different uh, background pressures and all that. So, uh, a lot of these things are done like uh, then we put the move, movement of the plasma plume, uh, model them uh, by the blast wave uh, model, drag model, uh, the asymptotic model and all that. So, all those things are done to characterize the plasma and then we also calculate the electron temperature of the plasma and for that we actually look at the spectrum and take two uh, close by lines and look at the ratio of the intensity. So, there are by the line ratio method it is possible to find out the electron temperature because temperature comes here and then we also look at the number density. These two are the major parameters of a plasma, the electron temperature and also the number density. So, number density is calculated from stark broadening of the lines. So, these standard lines we know what is the line width. So, but if, when you measure it, you see that there is a stark broadening on that. We use that for finding out the number density. Now, so this is uh, the temperature and number density calculated for different ambient pressures for the zinc target using 100 from the second excitation. So, what we find is that the temperatures are less than 1 eV, actually fairly low temperature plasmas these are, cannot compare with uh, stars or anything and number densities are also low in the order of 10 to the power 15 per centimeter cube. Now, one can also make use of interferometry for estimating the number density. So, we have set up the max sender interferometer and uh, then, then, then what you do, here you have the target, you send the laser pulse to the target to produce the plasma and then your probe laser beam is actually passing through there and then the interferometric pattern that you will see here is recorded. So, that is done and so you get an interferogram. So, you take its Fourier spectrum and then filter it one side band is taken because what you see at the center is just the carrier and then an inverse Fourier transform is done and then what you what you get is something called a wrapped face map. So, this wrapped face map is then unwrapped numerically and that gives you information about the phase of uh, because it is essentially a phase calculation. This is done and under the assumption that the plume has an axial symmetry, then the radial number densities can be calculated but through an able inversion of the phase map. So, these things we have just started doing now, have not really published anything but the students have uh, really done some good job and uh, so these are the uh, new results that we have very recently. Then shadowgraphy is another way to do this, that is also done. X-rays we have measured because these plasmas actually contain a large range of wavelengths. So, if you have an X-ray detector, you can actually determine the X-rays. So, we see emission in the uh, 20, like 30, 40, 50 kV range, uh, these are soft X-rays, so uh, they are there. Now, the last part is surface structuring using exotic laser beams. So, the motivation to structure a surface or a or pattern a surface is that the surface properties optical, chemical, weighting, mechanical of solids are governed by their morphology. So, structured surfaces have diverse applications. 
coloration of metallic and semiconductor surfaces, tailoring the wetting properties, controlling bacterial colonization, cell growth, improve the tribological performance. So, there are various things there. And it is seen that nanosecond versus femtosecond laser abrasion, femtosecond gives you a much cleaner pattern compared to the nanosecond one because the nanosecond pulse contains more energy in it and therefore the heating effect is more. So, we use femtosecond pulses for this. So, this is a schematic of the surface structuring setup. The laser beam comes like this. There is a mirror here. So, this is a reference uh, to measure the energy and uh, so the uh, half verb plate plus the polarizing beam splitter is uh, good for changing the energy and here this is a shutter, a mechanical shutter actually and then focused and this is the target. This is the target, we used the targets like silicon, fusilicon and all that. So, it is kept there on a translation stage so that you can move the position of the target. So, we generated femtosecond optical vortex beams for doing our structuring. So, what is done here is to start with a Gaussian beam, a specially Gaussian beam and then you actually make it a vortex beam. So, what is a vortex beam? So, before that we will look at the photon momentum. The momentum of the photon has linear and angular parts. The linear momentum is given by h cross k and the angular momentum has two parts. One is a spin angular momentum which comes for which is there for circularly polarized light given by s is equal to small s h cross with s is plus or minus 1, but it can also have orbital angular momentum. If there is uh, a phase variation along the azimuthal direction. So, if the beam is coming like this and if this is a cross section of the beam, the azimuthal direction is this. So, if there is a phase variation like that, then it can have orbital angular momentum and that is given by L is equal to small l h cross where small l is the number of twists in the helical wavefront because the wavefront is now helical. So, number of twists if that is more uh, per wavelength, then that gives you more uh, orbital angular momentum. So, the total angular momentum is given by S plus L. So, an optical vortex beam also known as a screw dislocation of phase singularity, it has a spiral phase wavefront around a central point and at the central point there is uh, the phase is not defined. So, this is basically something like a whirlpool, the, the intensity is actually moving like that and the phase rotates about the optical axis, uh, the top and the number of twists the light experiences in one wavelength of propagation is called the topological charge and it can be positive or negative depending on whether it is uh, right handed or left handed. Now, this is how it looks. So, you can have topological charges of uh, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2 and all that, but when you go even beyond 3, people have named it uh, pasta fusilli. So, because you can see <laughs> Italians have worked a lot on this. So, I think that is why they have named it like this. So, it becomes uh, the more more and more springier uh, pasta basically. So, uh, and how to generate the, uh, the beam, uh, how to generate the vortex beam. So, you can do it by using something called a spiral face plate and on the spiral face plate uh, steps are etched like this. And the uh, number of steps you have, so each step corresponds to a phase lag of 2 pi for the wavelength, for the uh, use, uh, applied wavelength. So, if you have more number of steps, then the topological charge is high. So, like L is equal to 20 here, here L is only 3 and here L is just uh, 1. So, you can have it as you want. And so, this is uh, the beam that we generated in our lab using an L is equal to 4 uh, phase plate. So, at the center you have uh, uh, no intensity, but uh, you have to, uh, to either side you have it and then we formed, we used these uh, beams to actually carve out micro needles from silica. So, this is a silicon surface. So, you can see that uh, at, you have to really use the right kind of uh, intensities and all that. So, this needs some kind of skill, you cannot just make it straight away like that. So, here you can see arrays of uh, silicon hmm, micro needles made like that. <coughs> so, to find some application for this, we, yes, uh, yeah, two minutes. Huh? Yeah. So, we, we, we put a gold coating on that. So, maybe you can also see a little bit of uh, golden nature on this. 
So why we did that was because we wanted to try surface enhanced Raman scattering. So on the gold coated uh, substrate with all those micro needles standing out, we measured SERS and we found that there is actually an enhancement in the Raman uh, efficiency there. It's not great. So when you calculate, you see that it's only like 100 or so. But even then it's, uh, <coughs> we did not do this on a commercial basis or something. It's, it's like uh, to demonstrate that you can actually get this and it is possible to do it. So to conclude, uh, this is uh, what the UNO lab has contributed so far. PhD students, not really a great number, it's only 10 including um, the external, the ex including three external registrations and only three postdocs I had. RA6 and VSP's project students interns were pretty large, uh, more than 80 and soon it will become 100 I think and publications with lot of uh, collaborators around the uh, number of papers is high. <laughs> I admit that the number of papers is high <laughs> for a lab. So it is more than 220 after I came to RRI but because I have many collaborators. Uh, two patents and uh, three book chapters and this is uh, the Google Scholar statistics as of now, as of yesterday actually. So I have to thank students, postdocs, RAs, visiting students, collaborators, Ibrahim and team, Suresh and team, uh, mechanical services, Jacob Rajan and team, computer division, Meena and Sujada for electronics, Suresh and team, electrical. Uh, now Suresh is not there, but uh, Yatindran for numerous same images because we, on many days, either I or Nancy would call him in the night and ask him, what time you are coming to RRI tomorrow? Will you be there by 9.30? Then he was always extremely patient and always, uh, because, you know, any structuring work without the same images is impossible to do it. So he has measured many, many same images for us and uh, particularly thankful to him and then members of EG for various doubts, this and that, we keep asking. Uh, <coughs> Savida, Harini, Purnima, LAM secretaries, that mean and library staff. So these are the present members of the group. So uh, Sabin, Deep Jyoti, uh, Amok, Cyril, myself, Sharon is not here. She went to Manchester for a master's. She was a project student, Sri Lakshmi and Beryl. So, Thank you very much. Okay, so let's thank Professor Philip for this uh, wonderful lecture. So, small questions. Uh, small question. Yes. Go back to the sequence three question. One of the previous ones, I think, uh, somewhere in the beginning, very beginning. Very beginning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. just the. Uh, no, just the slide before the right equation. Okay. Uh, it's yeah somewhere yeah yeah we yeah, prefer previous one ah yeah uh, hmm. see this usually this uh, like a laser pulse is a traveling wave right hmm. Hmm. so isn't it be a, shouldn't be a equation like exponential of r minus v t to the power something where is that actually because see this I is uh, okay so I'll tell you this is the radial part hmm? this is the radial part. Okay. So yeah, but it shouldn't it be just a function of R minus VT? I mean, V is, is This is transverse, but this is a longitudinal one. One is no in space. Huh. If I look at, it's a traveling wave, so it should be just a function of R minus VT, where the velocity it of the. It may not be explicitly written here like that, but it is there because I'll tell you which are these components. This is the time part. Hmm? So this is a, I mean, it's a pulse in time. So you have the time part here. So this is the propagation part. So that's independent of space and time, no? That's, that part is. No, you have written like a space part Gaussian, time part Gaussian. But instead of that, shouldn't it be just a space minus velocity times time whole square? Because this yeah, thing just moves, right? I mean, I the Gaussian understand, thing moves, right? I understand right? your point, but uh, it should come, it has to come there. Hmm? It is a, it is a frame yeah. of the pulse. Ah, probably the equation is written in the frame. I think that's the answer. See uh, the, the frame. No, because see, R is what? R is the? R is the transverse. 
when you take cross section you yeah. have r see yeah. the pulse is coming like this yeah hmm? so you take the cross section you have r there yeah. and it is propagating yeah. so that is taken care of by this omega. so this is not in the direction of propagation so uh, what i understand the z is the direction for yeah r is transverse to that direction. yes okay so, so then what he's saying is that he's taking it at the moment yeah so this is like same, uh, same of, uh, if you take uh, if you take this as z yeah. so you have that as the propagation axis and this as your r radial direction okay and then the time time um, time is there okay because it's a pulse see this r minus vt it doesn't uh, appear in all equations it depends on the frame i i agree to that i have seen that before but these are maxwell equations no no I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't come from the Maxwell mm. equation. No, you, the, you can the derive equation, it. But then, y yeah. equation is both uh, second derivative in time and second derivative in space, right? So mm. it should be r minus v t, no? So see, uh, you can write it even without writing r minus v t explicitly. This is called, this is a moving frame approximation, right? Okay. That's what you are talking about, isn't it? In no, what I understood that you have a Gaussian mm. thing, and the mm. Gaussian thing is moving, maybe mm. just uh, spreading also. Hmm. But it should no, that be not, hmm. like the, it's a Gaussian along a moving point, right? The Correct. Is not the shape of the pulse. The cross section is a Gaussian. Cross section is a Gaussian. But actually, it's a Gaussian in time also. Also time also, no? In time and also. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it should come in yeah, a that's combination. Why that's that not part. my point. Okay, maybe we can discuss later. Huh. It is perfectly okay to write it like this. Okay. See the, I, I think, as you said, it depends entirely on the coordinate frame. There's a moving frame and also, you know, the steady frame. So I believe in the steady frame, huh, in the steady frame, you have to write R minus VT, but in the moving frame, you don't have to write it. That is my understanding. Okay. I think that's what Sain then said, right? I think so. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Even the divergence of the beam is taken care of here. Okay, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, in your optical vortex, hmm. what is actually forming the spiral? The face. Then, what happens is, see, the wave front is not plane now. Hmm. You start with a plane wave front uh, for the Gaussian beam, hmm. but once your face plate is there, hmm. and because it is indented like that, you know, it's a staircase function, mm -hmm. several staircases. So, as you, basically you move through more material. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. When there is more material, there is delay. Mm -hmm. Because this is a uh, refractive index is higher than one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, that makes part of, see that, that makes the face go like a screw. Okay. Okay. Because some part of the face is advanced, okay. the other part is following it. Okay. So, something that was going like this, mm -hmm. straight, becomes something like this. Okay, huh. so if this phase is spiraling, huh. uh, why do you expect that if you ab ablate with that wave, huh. it will generate a spiral in the structure formed? Because <laughs> it should depend on the intensity, I thought. Actually, it does. Huh. See, it is both, I would say. Hmm. It's the intensity and also how you... See, actually this is like... Uh, exactly, you, you really gorge out something from that surface. Mm -hmm. So, because because of the angular momentum, mm -hmm. in addition to, you know, I mean, the plane wave does not have that angular momentum. Okay. This guy has angular momentum. Okay. So, it will actually take the thing out like that. Okay. So, I had another slide which I did not show because time limitation. Okay. So, there it's uh, shown how. So, basically, what happens is the central portion remains. Mm -hmm. Everything else is taken out. Okay. So, that is how the pillar appears. Thanks. <laughs> okay. If there is no more question, then let's thank the speaker once more. Thank you very much. So,